I'm not weak. I may be stupid, but I'm not weak. What happened to me shouldn't happen to my worst enemy. Now I'm sitting here with my head in my hands, wondering how the hell I got to this point in my life. I got screwed big time, and some people think I brought it on myself, or at least wasn't man enough to prevent it. Bullshit. One tour of duty in Iraq and another in Afghanistan fighting terrorists should dispel any rumors of my manliness. It's just that I've seen so much violence in my life, I just can't take it anymore. So why am I sitting here feeling sorry for myself? Three hours ago, I stood before a judge who told me that my wife, now ex, could get half of everything I ever worked for, plus half of my state pension, plus alimony, plus custody of my three-year-old daughter. All I could do was sit back and watch this asshole judge bend me over, shove my pathetic life up his ass, and send the only woman I've ever loved into the arms of another man. Divorce is not for the faint of heart. But instead of bemoaning my life, I think I need to explain what happened. It's an old story, a story of love found and love lost. My name is John, and what I'm about to tell you is hard to convey, but every word of it is true. It all started about nine months ago. I had just returned from my annual visit to the Veterans Hospital in Richmond and was feeling worse than I had before I got there. They poked and prodded, stuck all kinds of needles in me, did a dozen x-rays and CT scans just to see if I was any less disabled than when I was drafted four years ago. No, I still can't wipe my ass without my hand bouncing back and forth between my cheeks like the clapper of an old bell. The slight limp caused by having only two toes on my right foot still persists. And let's not forget the nightmares. After two days of benign torture, some doctor signed a paper saying I was still 100% disabled. Thanks, Doc. I could have told you that. The disability does not prevent me from fulfilling my marital duties and earning a living. I work from home buying and selling things online. This way I make a nice supplemental income, almost as much as my disability pension. Anyway, I had just pulled into the driveway when I saw my lovely wife Amanda sunbathing in the backyard. She was dressed in the most revealing white bikini and was lying face down on a chaise lounge. For a 30-year-old woman, she was absolutely gorgeous. I just sat in the car and stared at her, feeling myself getting an arousal that would soon demand attention. And the center of that attention was lying on a chaise lounge 50 feet away from me. I got out of the car, walked around the bushes, and stood next to her, casting a shadow over her beautiful blonde hair and dark tanned shoulders. Hey, you're blocking the sun, she complained, turning around and seeing me. Oh, it's you, soldier boy. Is that a banana in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? I was feeling 100% better now and was determined to play. I brought you a little present, I teased. A small one for crying out loud. If memory serves me correctly, your little present is big enough to make me climb the walls in absolute ecstasy. How about a little wall climbing right now? Where's our girl? She stayed at her grandmother's for the day. Do you want to play or not? The bikini never made it into the house, and neither did half of my clothes. By the time we collapsed on the bed, we were naked and entwined in each other's arms like two horny octopuses. She was breathing, but barely, barely. I watched her sleep. She was so peaceful and beautiful, I could only stare at her. I loved her more than life itself. I got up and went to the bathroom to relieve myself and clean up a bit. As I stood there peeing and looking around, feeling quite full, I noticed something on the floor between the tub and the toilet. After shaking off the last few drops, I reached down and picked up a small piece of trash, but before I could throw it in the trash can, I saw a word I hadn't seen in a while. On a piece of red foil, I saw the letters T-R-O. The rest of it was missing, but I knew exactly what it was. In the service, I had seen and used them enough, but I don't use them now. I don't need it. After our little girl was born, I castrated myself and have been shooting at point-blank range ever since. Why the hell is the corner of a condom wrapper lying in my bathroom? I just stood there shocked, naked, and in shock. Looking over my shoulder, I saw Amanda lying on the bed with her arms spread and snoring. She hadn't moved since her last orgasm. I sat down on the toilet and watched her snoring. I thought about how passionate she had just been. She's not usually easy in bed, but this time it was different. More demands, more power, more, well, more of everything. Until a moment ago, I'd loved it, 
but now I was holding something I shouldn't be holding. What does all of this mean? Is there a good explanation for why there's a condom wrapper in my bathroom? How could that be? I thought I might have a problem. I found all of our clothes and was going to put them in the laundry basket, but I saw that it was empty. Amanda doesn't do laundry until Monday night, so why was the hamper empty on Friday? I put on shorts and a t-shirt and headed to the laundry room. In the dryer, I found a set of sheets for our bed and a few other more curious items. There was a set of Amanda's sexiest underwear and the little white dress she wore whenever we went to the dance. There were also a few bath towels and a washcloth. All of this meant absolutely nothing, or meant exactly what it looked like. I needed to think about it. I grabbed a couple beers and went out to the backyard. It was almost dark when I saw the light in the kitchen and Amanda's head peeking out from behind the windowsill. She came out wearing my old t-shirt and sat down next to me. Is something wrong, baby? She asked. I remained silent. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know if what I was thinking was true or not. If I asked her about it and she lied, I knew I was ten times worse off. If she told me the truth, I wasn't sure I could handle it either. I just sat there in silence. Baby, talk to me. What's going on? My hand moved on its own. My mind wasn't telling her what to do. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a small red piece of trash. I held it in front of her. It took a few moments for her to focus her gaze on it, but when she did, her eyes closed and her lower lip stuck out. After a moment of silence, she stood up and went into the house. After another minute, the light came on in our bedroom. I sat in the semi-darkness wondering what was going on, afraid to find out. After a few minutes, I picked up two empty beer bottles and threw them in the trash can on my way into the house. When I got to our bedroom, Amanda was already dressed and putting her things in her suitcase. I'll be out of here in a few minutes, she said sadly. I'm going to go to my sister's. I'll come back in a few days and get the rest of my stuff. For the second time, I was in complete shock. My mind was perceiving everything but not allowing rational thought. My mouth wasn't working either. She looked up from packing with tears in her eyes and said, I've been wanting to tell you for a couple weeks now, but never could find the strength. Now you know. Now you won't have to worry about me lying to you or cheating on you anymore. You'll be able to find someone else who won't treat you with disdain. She went back to packing. What the hell is going on? I finally said loudly, almost too loudly. She looked at me, still with the same tear-drenched face, but now with a slight fear. I can't tell you. It would hurt too much. Hurt who? Me or you? It would hurt you too much. I just can't. I walked over to her bed and stood very close to her. I stood as tall as I could to appear as threatening as possible. I didn't want to hit her, but I wanted to know what the hell was going on. Tell me or, or what? You're going to hit me. You're not going to hit me. You can't hurt anyone, much less me. No, you won't hurt me, and I won't hurt you if I say anything else. My hand reacted again, out of control of my mind. I pushed her onto her back on the bed. Leaning toward her, I raised my fist in the air and faced her nose to nose. Don't be too damn sure, I shouted. Now tell me what's going on. She covered her eyes with her hands and sobbing uttered the words that ended my existence. I'm in love with someone else. I've been dating my boss at work for the past few months. At first we were just playing around with each other, but now we've fallen in love. I never wanted this to happen and I didn't want to hurt you, but I love him and we've decided to live together. She took her hands away from her eyes and looked into mine, stabbing her knife into my heart again. You still can't give me everything I want. Your disability pension doesn't pay for shit. You're great in bed, but that's all we have left, sex. It's not enough. I want more. I want a big house and a nice car. I want to shop at a nice store, not Goodwill. And I don't love you anymore. I know I hurt you, but I didn't mean to. I'm sorry it had to end this way. Now please get off me and let me go. She slid out from under me, grabbed her suitcase, and ran out of the room. I was still bent over the bed when I heard the front door slam and her car squealed out of the driveway. So how did I react to my wife telling me she no longer loved me? I did what any self-respecting army veteran would do. I spent the next hour trashing the bedroom and then went out into the backyard and drank myself into oblivion. I don't remember anything that happened after that. I could have howled at the moon if I'd only known, 
but when I came to my senses the next morning, I was lying under the picnic table, holding my ground as if, if, if I didn't, I would fly away. I'd had hangovers before, but what I experienced then was the mother of all hangovers. I looked up and saw a pair of hairy legs in front of me. They were leading to the asshole I'd known all my life, Larry. Larry and I grew up together and went into the army together. We fought together and got drunk together. We even got married together. I married Amanda and he married Amanda's sister. It's about time you woke up, he yelled after me. Shh, please don't yell, I pleaded. I'm sorry, he whispered. Is there anything you need? Like a faucet to get your ass out from under the table? Maybe a new head, maybe something else to drink? By my count, there are ten beer bottles and an empty bottle of Jack Daniels lying around the yard. I got a bottle of wild turkey in my car. Do you want me to go get it? No, asshole. Just get out of my way or you'll need a shower in a minute. Larry jumped off the picnic bench and backed up a few steps. At that moment, I threw up the most colorful mixture of vomit I had ever seen through partially closed eyes. I spewed out all my guts. I was sure my small intestines were somewhere in that puddle as well. When the dust settled, or rather, when the vomit settled, I looked up at Larry. I expected to see his usual, I told you so, smirk, but this time there was none. Somehow I crawled out from under the table and sat on the floor next to the puddle of my night's debauchery. Damn, how bright the sun was shining. Come on, I'll help you get in the shower. Larry lifted me upright and led me inside. He turned on the cold water and I just stood there watching the water run down me, clothes and all. When I felt the coldness of the water, I turned it off and reached in for a towel. Larry held one out to me and I started wiping my head. Larry knew the routine because we had been helping each other get sober since we were teenagers. Put on some dry clothes and I'll meet you in the kitchen with a cure for what ails you. Only death will cure me now, I moaned. I walked into the kitchen and lowered my sorry ass into a chair. I was physically and emotionally shattered. I put my head on my hands and prayed that it would hit me. Thankfully, the weather outside was clear and sunny. Oh well, so much for prayers. Here, eat this. Larry placed two pieces of toast and a glass of tomato juice in front of me. I ate and drank, but I didn't feel any better. At least emotionally, I didn't feel better. So what are you going to do? Amanda came over last night and told us what she did. She's going to stay with us until she gets settled one way or another, and Darla is with her. I just want to know what you're planning. I'll help in any way you want. I know her boss, Herbert Hubley. That asshole sold us our minivan last year. Just because he owns the biggest Ford dealership in the city doesn't mean we can't knock him down a peg. I don't care if he runs for mayor. He's got a lot of nerve hanging out with a married woman. And Amanda treated you like crap. She needs to learn a lesson, too. Maybe we'll get a couple guys from the old squad and pay the asshole a visit at his ranch. Maybe he'll just disappear on his way to work one day. I know if my wife did to me what Amanda did to you, I'd... Stop! The toast and tomato juice reappeared. Leaving Larry to clean up after himself, I went to the spare room and went to bed. I did something I hadn't done in a very long time. I cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, the kitchen was clean and Larry was gone. He had left a note on the counter. Call me when you realize what you want to do. I found a ginger ale in the refrigerator, went out and sat in the rocking chair on the porch. I thought about Amanda. I thought about myself. I thought about our marriage. I thought about my daughter. I thought about revenge. I sat there all day, thinking. It was almost dark when Larry showed up again. He didn't say a word, just handed me a sandwich and a soda and sat down. How's it going? He asked between bites. What? Well, what are you going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I'm going to get her back, even if she wants to come back. What she did to that asshole was beyond me. She made her choice and I lost. I'm yesterday's news. So what do you want to do with this asshole? Larry, let him die, okay? I don't want to use the asshole for target shooting or shave his ass and sell him to a Venezuelan whore. I had enough of that shit in Afghanistan. I hate him, it's true, but I can't hurt him any more than I can hurt her. Dude, he stole your wife, and if they end up together and Amanda gets custody of Darla, he'll steal your daughter too. 
You have to stand up for what's right. You have to fight for your family. You have to do something about it. I know that if my wife did the same thing to me as she did to you, her ass would be looking down at the surface of Caveman Lake from 30 feet up. Man, grow some balls, do something. I set my sandwich aside, looked at the best friend I'd ever had, and said, Larry, go home. He did. I never did anything. I didn't fight for divorce. I didn't fight for custody. I didn't say a word to Amanda. I just pulled the blanket over my lifeless body and got into the bottle. I spent six months in a self-imposed stupor. When I woke up, I found that all my love for Amanda had been washed away by the booze I poured out every morning. I put on the only suit I had left and went to my last divorce hearing. I was sober, but not thinking too well. By the time it was over, I was thinking clearly again. Pain will make you think very clearly. And now I'm sitting in this cafe mourning the death of my life. Maybe I'm weak. As I sit here, I think about the positives and negatives of divorce. Everyone focuses on the negative side, probably because pain is the hardest thing most people ever experience. Well, I've been through much worse. In Afghanistan, my Humvee was hit by an RPG and I was dragged into some hellish house where a fat Taliban warlord took great pleasure in shredding my skin with a bamboo stick for the next few weeks. And when he wasn't playing with his bamboo stick, the other sick bastards poured buckets of water on my face while I was tied to the bed and repeated over and over in their English, you do wrong to our man, we do wrong to you. Regardless of which side you are on, water torture is still torture. The pain of what my wife did was horrible, but so much other shit had been done to me that I could never do anything different, no matter how much I hated his guts. I didn't have an ounce of cruelty in me anymore. I was single again and Amanda married Herbert right after the divorce hearing. I wondered why she didn't stipulate alimony in the settlement agreement. Now I know. As time went on, I started seeing Amanda much more often than I wanted to. She appeared with Zasrans in his campaign commercials and was by his side on television during campaign trips. She dressed better, in expensive outfits she could now afford. Their faces were plastered all over town, mocking me and declaring to the world what a wimp I was. Somehow that asshole won the election and became mayor. Well, okay, goddammit. The upside of the divorce was that I got rid of a lying, cheating wife and our daughter adjusted to the change in daddy pretty quickly. Larry never spoke to me again, so I guess that can be categorized as a minus. There was little good in my life from this avalanche, and the fact remained that I remained a fool and a cuckold for the last year of our marriage. However, I still had a little itch that Larry had planted in my feeble mind that needed scratching. Now, nine months after I found a little nook with a condom wrapper next to the bathroom, and three months after my divorce was finalized, it was time to scratch that itch. One day I walked into a meeting with the new mayor. We sat across from each other like opponents in an arena. He probably thought I was such a wuss and wouldn't do anything after he won, but he was wrong. I intended revenge, but not with a single .45 caliber shot to the chest at point-blank range, not by humiliating him in front of the town and his family, making his new wife look like a whore, not by using any violence. I had other plans. Larry had planted the thought of revenge in my mind, and that's exactly what I planned to do, plant a small seed. Besides, the very large policeman standing just outside the door was discouraging me from doing anything outright. So what can I do for you, John? The asshole asked with a slight grin on his face. This isn't a business call, Herbie. It's personal. I just wanted to give you some information and a warning, and you can do whatever you want with it. Now let me finish before you say anything, because I need to say everything before you see the whole picture, okay? Shoot, I'm listening. Okay. First of all, I don't care if you repeat all of this to Amanda because she's going to deny everything anyway. She's very good at lying, but I'm going to say what I have to say, and then I'm going to get out of what you have left. I've recently been getting my house in order. I need to sell it and move into something smaller. I found some information that looks at my marriage differently, and you need to know that too. Herb, here's the deal. You're not the first, and I bet you won't be the last. I mean, you've been sleeping with Amanda for the last year, which led to our divorce. You know that part. What you don't know, and I didn't know until the last few days, is that she had two other affairs during our marriage before you. The first one was around the time our daughter was born, and the second was about a year ago, a year before she started living with you. 
As far as I know, each of these affairs lasted a little over a year. I don't know the names of the men yet, but I have some clues as to who they were. One of my problems is that I am now questioning whether I am the father of my own daughter. I'm going to do a DNA test to see if she is mine. If not, and I can figure out who her father is, then I'm going to use legal means to collect three years of child support. I'm sure I have enough evidence to file a lawsuit, but I'm not ready to do that yet. If you are her father, then this is just a warning that I am coming after you. If you're not, you have nothing to worry about. Well, not the paternity issue. I know Amanda has had two affairs. Well, three, counting you. But there could have been more that I don't know about and probably never will. Only Amanda knows that. I know she won't tell me and probably won't tell you either, but what I do know is that the woman I was married to for eight years, the woman I loved and gave everything to, was a chronic, cheating whore. Now I am free of her, and she is your problem. But it pains me to realize that I have lived a lie my entire adult life. Our marriage vows meant nothing to her. We went to church every Sunday and prayed to God for forgiveness of our sins, and the rest of the time she slept with other men in our marital bed. Hell, the worst part is that my daughter might not even be my daughter. She made a fool out of me, and I will live with that realization for the rest of my life. Well, that's all I have to say to you. Do you have any questions before I go? Yes, so why are you telling me all this? It's none of my business. Actually, it does concern Herb. You see, it should be a warning. It's the best thing I can do for you. I still don't understand. Just explain to me in simple words what you mean. I just sat there and with a disgusted smirk on my face told him what it all meant. Once fooled, always fooled, be warned. Now, with those words, I stood up and walked out of his office. As I walked to the parking lot, the grin was replaced by a wide grin from ear to ear. Sometimes the best things are just a seed of doubt. Mighty oaks grow from tiny acorns, so the saying goes. So why shouldn't a little doubt about his new wife's fidelity be a good thing? And doesn't it matter if everything I've said isn't true? The seed was planted in the fertile mind of the man who helped make a fool of me in my marriage. It may not change anything, but it could be a catalyst for discord between the newlyweds. Only time will tell. There goes the itch to scratch, I said, pulling away. Four years later, I'm sitting on the couch watching the local election results on TV. I smile slightly when it is announced that incumbent Mayor Herbert Hubley has just lost his bid for re-election. Commentators speculate that the asshole's personal life played a bigger role in his defeat than his performance as mayor. The IRS seized his Ford dealership and that hurt, but even more painful was his recent arrest for assaulting his wife and their impending divorce. Perhaps the voters just couldn't handle it. I look at the top of Megan's head, lean over and kiss her gently. She's the new lady in my life who is now asleep with her head resting on my shoulder. It's okay. She's not really into politics anyway.